Right then, well, please do turn with me to John chapter 11. The text we've got for this evening, the verse, is verse 37. Some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Now, the longer that we live in this world, the more we come to recognise that unexpected difficulties and disappointments and tragedies and afflictions are an unavoidable part of life. We see it all around us, don't we? Um, Ill health and bereavement, job loss, financial pressure, relationship difficulties, family trauma. And as Christians, we know that we're not exempt from these things. In fact, in some ways, it could be argued that Christians, in addition to the problems everybody else has, seem to have some other problems, you know? Um, the problems that particularly relate to the fact that we are Christians, that we become particular objects of the attacks of the devil and particular objects of the hostility of the world. Well, that's the way it is. But the question that arises is, if believers are the particular object of the love of Christ, and they are, why does he allow them to suffer in the ways that he does? Now, I don't know if you've ever asked that question, but it's a very real question. It comes up sometimes when we observe the way that believers we know suffer and we see the things they've gone through. Why has the Lord allowed that dear woman to have such sorrow and pain in her family circumstances? Or sometimes it comes up when we face afflictions and difficulties ourselves. Why has the Lord put me in this situation? And as he's all powerful and he loves me, why doesn't he just step in and deliver me? Now this evening, I want us to have a little look at this passage in John chapter 11 and see some of what it says about the suffering of Christians as we see it in the death of Lazarus. We can never do justice to this massive and mysterious topic, but I trust in the goodness of God there will be something here tonight for us that will help us. Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Here's our first big point. We live in a veil of tears. That's a description that's been used for our present world, and there's a lot of truth in that. We thank God that the world is a place of great joy. The Lord has given us so many good gifts. But the reality is it's a veil of tears. It's a place of sorrow as well. And we have to face up to the reality of suffering. Now, in this passage, you see, Lazarus is taken ill, and then he dies. For him, that quite likely meant a period of physical suffering. It meant a period of concern about the burden with his sisters. The fact that they're living together probably implies that his sisters were unmarried, so the care for them fell on him. Who is going to care for them now when Lazarus is facing death? For Mary and Martha, it undoubtedly meant looking after him in his sickness, the grief of his death, and the uncertainty that they faced for the future. The reality of suffering is all too real, isn't it? That it comes to us each in a myriad different forms. Now, let's stop and think about that. Suffering. Suffering is inevitable in a fallen world. There was no suffering in the Garden of Eden before the entrance of sin. But in a fallen world, suffering is inevitable because suffering is the result of sin. Sometimes it's the result of particular sins. Think of Ananias and Sapphira. Okay? But usually the reality of suffering is this, that because of the entrance of sin into the world, because of Adam's sin, God has cursed the world. And that's brought suffering and sorrow into the world in all its different forms. Genesis 3, three points, okay? The first one, the opposition of the devil. I will put enmity between you and the woman. That's an effect of the curse. The devil is at enmity with mankind. He's the enemy of mankind. And he's the enemy of the believer in particular. He prowls around like a lion seeking whom he may devour. And look at the book of Job. When he's allowed by God, he has particular influence and power that he uses in destructive ways. In the book of Job, Satan stirred up the Sabaeans 
so that he came and stole Job's livestock and killed his servant. And then a little later on, Satan manipulated the wind so that it caused a house to collapse and killed Job's children. There's a mystery there. But there's suffering in a fallen world because of the enmity of the devil. The second thing, the suffering that comes from disordered relationships. Genesis 3.16. To the woman, he said, I'll greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you'll bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. See, pain is common, not just in bearing children, but in raising them. And the strife and the selfishness strains even the closest of relationships. It's a fallen world. The third thing, the hardness of life. The Lord said to Adam, Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you'll eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it will bring forth for you. You'll eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you'll eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Lord is the Lord is telling him, from now on, making a living is going to be hard graft. Thorns and thistles, diseases and disasters are not going to be uncommon. And death is inevitable. It's a fallen world. Now, the world around us doesn't seem to understand that. The world around us seems to think that suffering is somehow chaotic. It's kind of an evolutionary necessity, you know? But God shows us clearly that suffering in the world is a reminder that the whole world is a fallen world and in need of redemption. And so here we are in John chapter 11. This little godly family, Lazarus and Mary and Martha, friends of the Lord Jesus Christ, and death comes and sorrow enters their hearts. Responses to suffering. There are three in this passage. And they're all different. Firstly, verse 37. The response of unbelieving Jews. They criticise God for the suffering. Could not this man, who opened the eyes of the blind, also have kept this man from dying? They've heard about the healing of the blind man in John chapter 9. And they thought, if he could do that and heal a man blind from birth, couldn't he just stop this man from dying? But think about why they're saying this. What's going on here? The basic assumption is that God is bound to stop suffering if he can. Because there's no way that suffering can be either good or kind. You know? So if God is there, then surely he must stop suffering. It's as if God is a combination of the United Nations and the Red Cross. His sole purpose is to step into difficult situations and stop the suffering. And when that doesn't happen, you get this criticism. It must be because either God doesn't care or because God is not powerful enough to do anything about it. And we hear that kind of thing all the time, don't we? But it's wrong. We know it's wrong. We know that Christ is perfectly able the Christ who healed the blind man could certainly have stopped Lazarus from dying. He's perfectly able because he's able to raise him from the dead. That's not the problem. There's no lack of power. But we know as well that there's no lack of love. We are told in the passage that he loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And we see his great love for them in the way that he raised him from the dead. So that understanding... The understanding of people who criticize God for suffering as if God is somehow doing wrong. It's everywhere, but it's poison. It's casting aspersions on the power and the love of Christ who has all authority in heaven and on earth. The second one, Mary and Martha, the response of believers. They trust God even in the midst of their suffering and grief. Now notice this, verse 3. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. They know that the love of Christ is beyond question. 
even in their suffering. And then you get verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And a little later on, Mary says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. They have perfect confidence in his power. If he'd been there, of course he could have kept Lazarus from dying. And even now he can do whatever he wants. In the heart of a believer, there's no fundamental challenge to the love and the power of God. We know it because we've experienced it in the cross and in his goodness and in his care for us time after time. It can be, there can be an onslaught and it can be challenged, but fundamentally our hearts are on the Lord's side, aren't they? You see, there's something else here. Verse 23 and 24. Jesus says to Martha, your brother will rise again. And Martha says, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Believers know that Christ has conquered suffering and death and that a new day, a better day is coming. The day when there'll be a new heaven and a new earth, when all tears will be wiped away and sorrow and sickness and suffering will be gone forever. They're aware of that. It's a wonderful thing. And how often do we find as believers that this is where we are? We know that the Lord loves us. We know that the Lord is able to deliver us. But we find ourselves in difficult suffering situations which can be hard to bear. But the Lord, in his goodness, gives us the encouragement that a better day is coming. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go again, I'll come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What happens there? We behold his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. To be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. It's far better. So comfort one another with these things. The hope of glory. It's a great thing, you know. And this is one of the big differences between believers and unbelievers in their suffering. For unbelievers, this world is all there is. And so if there's a God, he needs to sort out the problems in the here and now. But believers know that because of the saving work of Jesus Christ, problems will be sorted out. There is life beyond the grave, and there is a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. That's a wonderful and an encouraging thing, isn't it? So even in the midst of their grief, they trust in Christ and they look forward. But there's something more. The unbelievers... They criticise Christ for the suffering. The believers, they trust Christ in the midst of their suffering. But what about Christ himself? Christ allows the suffering. Verse 6. When he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after that, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. He knows he's sick and he waits until he's dead. He allows the suffering and the bereavement and the death and the grief to happen in the lives of those he loves. Now this opens a window, a window of understanding into all sorts of afflictions and sufferings that God's people experience in their lives. You see, the bottom line is the Lord could remove them, but he doesn't. We've just got to face up to that. The Lord could remove them, but he doesn't. He could chain Satan so that Satan isn't allowed to come anywhere near us. But as with Job, sometimes he allows him. He could remove temptation far from us. But sometimes he allows temptation to come close to us. He could deliver us from the fallenness of our hearts. When he saves us, 
he could make us pure and perfect like the saints in heaven. But he doesn't. He allows that fallenness of our hearts to continue so that the spirit fights against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit and this battle goes on in us and it causes us such grief who will deliver us from this body of death. He could keep us from sickness or pain if he wanted, but he doesn't. He could protect us from natural disasters, from the spite of evil men, from the impersonal callousness of these massive corporations all around us that just chew us up at one end and spit us out. He could deliver us from death if he wanted and take us to heaven in a chariot like he did for Elijah. But he doesn't. He places us here in a veil of tears. Now let's think about this. Why is it? Christ is at work in the veil of tears. There's a lot here that's mysterious, a lot we've got to be careful about. Let me just mention two things that are traps that as God's people we need to do our best never to fall into. Okay, the first one is, in the midst of the sufferings and the difficulties of life, we need to be careful that we don't question his sovereignty. God is the potter, we are the clay, he is the master, and we are the servant. It's for him to determine and command, and it's for us to obey. And in many circumstances in life, we'd be saved a lot of grief and suffering if we focused on obedience, Lord, what will you have me to do? Rather than criticism, Lord, why are you doing this? It's difficult, but we need to trust God, the sovereign God, the God of love who's on the throne. See, far too often, our questions can be motivated by unworthy motives. It's understandable when we're in pain, but we need to be careful. Questions like this, motives like this. Shouldn't the Christian life be easy? Or at least easier than it is? It seems to be unfair. Shouldn't the Lord explain himself? After all, if we are his friends, doesn't he tell us what he does? But we don't understand what's going on. The Lord never explained himself to Job. He just revealed himself to Job in glory as the sovereign God. We think that we deserve to be treated better. But the truth is, the Lord has already treated us far, far better than we deserve. He saved us from sin and he's delivered us from hell. And he's got great purposes to accomplish in us for all eternity. We need to be very careful when we ask questions like that. We can fall into the trap of thinking that we are wiser than God. The second thing we need to watch is that we don't doubt his love. Now, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ proves once and for all the love of God for sinners. It proves the love of the Father because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. It proves the love of Christ because greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. When we have questions in our mind about what would the love of God look like in this situation, if he really loved me, wouldn't he deliver me? Go back to the word of God. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. We have to keep our focus on that. The love of God is not in question. The love of Christ is not in question. And to doubt his love just brings coldness into our own souls. But because he loves us, we know this. When we suffer according to the will of God, there is no anger in the cup from the Father. Christ has drunk the cup of God's anger to the very dregs. And now he loves us. And he's not angry with us. And he sometimes does things with us that we don't understand. But in all our afflictions, he is afflicted. He's never cold and unconcerned. 
and other female. So there are two things there, two traps we have to watch. Questioning his sovereignty and doubting his love. But when we've done that from this passage, we can say two more things. And the first one is in verse 4. When Jesus heard, he said to his disciples, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Verse 40, Jesus said to Martha, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? What is Christ doing in a veil of tears? He's displaying his glory. Now see, when Christ comes into the situation, here in John chapter 11, it's not just to give Mary and Martha the hope of life beyond the grave. Thank God for that, that's wonderful. But it's not only that. He comes into the situation to show his victory here and now in the veil of tears. This sickness is for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. This suffering has come so that I can step into the situation and I can show you the truth about myself and what I think about the suffering and the fallenness and the trouble of this world. So, verse 33, Christ is grieved by the suffering. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in spirit and was troubled. Look at the pain that sin has caused for Mary. Troubled. Verse 38. Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Look at the devastation that sin has caused for Lazarus. That's what's going on in the heart of Christ. He's grieved at the suffering and he's angry at the sin. The, the word in those two verses that's translated groaned means indignant, angry. Christ isn't seeing the pain in the lives of his people that sin has caused. He's not seeing the death that sin has caused. And he's not just upset by it. He's indignant. This is the very thing that he's come into the world to deliver us from. This is the result of the curse. But you know what it says in Galatians 3? Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Because it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So here, in the midst of the veil of tears, Christ comes to display his glory. He comes to the tomb and he says, roll the stone away. But Lord, it's been four days, there's a stench. Now, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they roll the stone away. And Christ steps forward and he cries, Lazarus, come forth. And he comes forth. Now, what's going on? This is a foretaste of the victory of heaven experienced in the veil of tears. That's what's going on. Christ has come to display his glory. And we see his victory in this personal situation. But in the midst of suffering and trouble, all the things that sin has produced, Christ brings the victory. He doesn't leave it until the last day. He brings it into their experience now. Then, Lazarus is restored to his sisters, Mary and Martha, and their tears are turned to joy. What's going on? It's a foretaste of the joy of heaven in the veil of tears. He doesn't leave it until the last day. It's almost as if he can't contain himself. He's so indignant by what sin is doing. He knows the victory is secure, but he wants people to see it now, to see his glory, to taste the joy, to know that in the power and love of Christ, it's okay. And Lazarus comes forth delivered. The curse is overcome. 
Lazarus feels in himself the reality of the power of Christ, the resurrection and the life. What's going on? It's the power of Christ experienced here and now. He shows his glory. Now, I think there are numerous situations in our lives as believers, and I'm speaking to Christians particularly tonight. There are numerous experiences in our lives as believers where that's exactly what Christ does. In this world, it's a veil of tears. We're not promised exemption from the suffering of the world, but we have the promise that one day we will be delivered from it. No sorrow there, no sickness there, no tears there, but you know what? Christ in his mercy comes and gives us a foretaste now. It's a wonderful thing. And the suffering that sin produces, he delivers us from to give us a foretaste of glory. I think that's a wonderful thing, and we need to recognise that. God's purpose in the suffering of his people is to show us something about himself, to show us something about the glory that's yet to come, and to give us a taste of it in the midst of the trials and the burdens of day-to-day -day life. That's the first thing. In the veil of tears, he shows us his glory. The second thing is in verse 15. I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Verse 39. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? What is Christ doing in the veil of tears? He's strengthening the faith of his people that they might trust him in the midst of their sufferings and so they might see something of the glory of God. Now see, in hardship and suffering, we come to experience in the goodness of God the power and the victory and the compassion of Christ. See, it often takes time and it often comes in little drops of light. Even in the book of Job, you know, there are songs in the night. It's an interesting thing. The Lord knows how to sustain his people in the midst of their suffering. He knows how to give them manna in the wilderness. He knows how to strengthen our souls. Sorrow might endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. We experience that. It's a glorious thing. And it comes about generally as we trust him. As we trust him, we see the glory of God. And what that does is it flags up for us one stark contrast here between God's people and other people, between believers and unbelievers. It's when we believe we see the glory of God. When we believe in the midst of our sufferings, my Father is on the throne. My Saviour loves me. He has the power and he's moved with compassion, but he has a purpose I don't understand. Because he's my Saviour, I trust him. When we do that, and we see something of the glory of God, it gives us a sense of liberty. It gives us something to hold us that the world doesn't have. The world doesn't believe, so it doesn't see the glory of God. So it can't see the purpose in the suffering. It makes no sense for them, unless God steps in and stops the wars, what is he doing? He's not even worth being called God. But we know different. The battle is a greater battle, and the greater battle Christ has already won. The victory is a greater victory, and there is a heaven reserved for us in glory. And the foretastes of that greater victory filter down into this veil of tears as the Lord delivers us and strengthens us in the midst of our suffering. Now think about this. By faith, we experience the victory and the power of Christ in the midst of our afflictions. How many times have you been attacked by the devil and by faith in Jesus Christ you've resisted the devil and he has fled from you? Did you know that those people who are outside of Christ do not have that promise and they can never see that glory of God? But we can 
in a veil of tears. How many times in the midst of temptation have you looked to the Lord for a way of escape and you've trusted his word and you've strengthened your heart with the love of Christ that he knows what's going on in your life and the Lord has made a way of escape for you and he's led you out into an open path and you've seen something of the power and victory of Christ, the glory of God. Did you know unbelievers don't have that promise? They live in sin as their natural domain, but we have it. And the Lord gives us glimpses of heaven, a foretaste of the glory of God. I don't know about the state of your heart, but I know you're sinners just like me. And if you're anything like me, one of the greatest burdens that you have to carry in life is yourself. But isn't it true that little by little the Lord is changing us? And there are things true about us now in terms of sins we used to love and now we hate. And things about Christ that we rejoice in and delight in that used to leave us cold. And we say, that's a foretaste of glory. That's looking forward to the day when I'll see him and I'll be like him. Because I'll see him as he is. It comes by faith when we behold his glory as in a mirror. And we are transformed from one degree of glory to another. He's showing us his glory in a veil of tears. In our pain and in our sickness, how many times have Christians said to you, I don't know how I would have got through it if it wasn't for the Lord? Do you know that's true? And unbelievers don't have that. But even in the midst of our suffering and our pain, Christ steps in and he gives us a taste of the delight that's yet to come when this corruptible body is made like his incorruptible body and we are with him forever. And in death, and in the face of death, isn't it true that the Lord is our shepherd? His rod and his staff, they comfort me. And unbelievers don't have that. But we have it because Christ is the resurrection and the life. And what he does in a veil of tears is he reveals his glory. Now, I think we have to hold on to this. We have to try and understand what the Lord is doing. We're not in heaven yet. We're in a veil of tears. We are still subject to the suffering and the curse of the world. But in this world, Christ hasn't waited and shown us nothing. In this world, Christ comes to us and he shows us his glory. The Lord knows what he's doing, and we can always trust him. Job says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him? Job says, he knows the way I take. When he's tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Eli says, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. It's an important thing, isn't it, to trust God by faith in a veil of tears. Here's the last thing. There's value in affliction for the people of God. I've touched on this to some degree, but I need to say a bit more. You read the history books, and many of God's greatest saints have been sufferers. And some of them would testify that they've learned things in a veil of tears that was very hard for them to learn anywhere else. Here's a few. Affliction drives us to pray. Now, times of affliction can be times of soul-searching. Christians say, is the Lord chastising me for my sin? Is the Lord teaching me something? Fair questions. We have to go to God with it and examine ourselves in the light of his word. It might be true. Thank God for the affliction, because before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. He can purge us. It might not be true. It might not be that there's any sin. It might be that in his sovereign purpose, his hand is upon us. But you know what? Cast your burden on the Lord and he'll sustain you. We learn that by experience, as the people of God did when they had manna even in the wilderness. It drives us to pray. The second thing it does is it makes fellowship with God vital and valuable. 
It's the Lord who is the refuge from the storm. It's the Savior who understands our weakness. He is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Nobody knows and nobody cares as our God does. And there are situations in life where it's only the one who's bruised us who can heal us. Hosea 6. Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal. He is stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he'll revive us. On the third day, he'll raise us up, that we might live in his sight. Sorrow might endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. The third thing, it makes promises precious to us. Now, I read this illustration in Spurgeon. I stole it. I think it's great. He says, there are certain sorts of invisible ink that you cannot see on a piece of paper until you hold it up to the heat. What a great illustration. And his point is, there are certain promises of God that are like that. You only really see them when you see them in the heat of affliction. Remember the word to your servant upon which you have caused me to hope. Psalm 119 and verse 49. Sometimes in afflictions, God gives us a word. We see the relevance of it to our own situation. He gives us a promise. And that promise gives us hope. God is faithful. And he'll bring us through. A fourth thing. Afflictions drive afflictions prepare us to help others when we've suffered we know how other people feel in their suffering when we've learned to trust god in our suffering we know what other people need and we know how difficult it can be and when we've been comforted by god we know the tenderness and the compassion and the patience and the gentleness of Christ for his people when they suffer. 2 Corinthians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. That's why Paul, who'd been a violent, intolerant man, became a man filled with compassion and gentleness. Because he'd experienced it from Christ in his own affliction and his own trouble. The fifth thing. Affliction can be a means of honour. And what I mean is this. It's the honour of the servant to glorify his master, isn't it? To serve the master. That's the honour of the servant. Well, if Christ is glorified, if Christ reveals his glory in our affliction, isn't that honour enough? And here's the very last thing. Verse 45. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mavi and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. It's a witness to the world. When Christ can keep his people in the midst of suffering, the world asks why. And when Christ delivers his people from suffering, the world stands and watches. If he did that for you, Maybe he can do that for me. He can, you know. Because he's the same saviour to everyone who trusts him. Though you go through the fire and he tries you, you will come out like gold. He's the resurrection and the life. The best is yet to come. Thank God for it. But in this world, he shows us his glory. And he brings us through. Let's pray. Father, this evening, we thank you for the truth of your word. We ask 
that in our circumstances tonight, whoever we are and whatever we're going through, that you'd help us through the passage of your word that we've looked at. We thank you that you're so concerned about us, that you don't just leave us until eternity, as wonderful as that would be, but in our lives, you break in and you visit us and you help us. You show us your glory and you help us to trust you. Father, do it for us, we pray. Keep us, Lord, keep us in the veil of tears and might all the honour and all the glory be yours. We ask it in the Saviour's name. Amen.